Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. I have two things to talk about today. One is a new drug approval that I think we should pay a little bit of attention to. So um, just a couple weeks ago, May 30th of this year, the FDA expanded the approval of a drug called Zelgans. You probably have seen it advertised on television for the treatment of adults with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. The drug was previously approved, and it still is approved, for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. This is the first oral drug to be approved for this condition. The others have to be delivered through intravenous or subcutaneous injection. Um, now, just by way of a little bit of background, ulcerative colitis is an autoimmune disease in which the lining of the colon becomes irritated and inflamed and ulcers develop. This results in abdominal discomfort and diarrhea, blood in the stool, lots of, uh, lots of side effects um, as a consequence. There are numerous causes which include genetic predisposition, which is a really tiny part of it, diet, viral or bacterial infections, allergies, hormones, and vaccinations. The disease tends to relapse and remit. Sometimes the periods of remission can be quite lengthy, but the sad part about it is that it almost always comes back and at some time it becomes uh, steadily progressing. The FDA's approval to use Zelgians for ulcerative colitis was based on three clinical trials. I'm going to share with you the data, then I'm going to tell you the side effects of the drug because um, I think if you look at the risk-benefit ratio, it's really not so good. So two eight-week trials showed that 10 milligrams of Zelgians twice daily resulted in remission for 17 to 18 percent of patients by the eighth week. Now if you take those patients, we start out with 17 to 18 percent. Of those at one year, 35% of those who took five milligrams twice daily were still in remission at the end of 52 weeks. 47% taking 10, uh, 10 milligrams twice daily were in remission at two weeks. So you're talking about um, you know, less than 10% at one year of this group being in any good shape at all. And a placebo-controlled trial of patients who achieved some type of clinical response by eight weeks, but it wasn't remission, 34% of those who were given five milligrams of Zelgans twice daily were in remission at 52 weeks. For patients given 10 milligrams twice daily, the remission rate was 41%. So um, not very good. Not, I mean, we're talking about less than half of the patients benefit at all, and the number that benefit in a significant way, very, very tiny. Now let's talk about the side effects. The most common side effects in these trials, when, it, when Zelgans was used for um, UC were diarrhea, increased cholesterol levels, headaches, shingles, increased creatinine phosphokinase, common cold, rash, and upper respiratory tract infections. Less common events, again, during the trials were malignancy, including lymphoma, and serious infections, some of which led to hospitalizations and death. A black box warning for the drug includes all these that I just listed, and some other side effects including pneumonia, cellulitis, herpes, diverticulitis, appendicitis, tuberculosis, non-melanoma skin cancer, gastrointestinal perforations, neutropenia, and anemia. These are pretty serious side effects for a drug that has a less than 50% efficacy rate at one year. Now, there are many other drugs that are used to treat ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, another autoimmune disease, but it, it's not limited to the colon. They're, they're both considered inflammatory bowel disease, but uh, ulcerative colitis is limited to the colon. Um, the other drugs include other biologic drugs, antibiotics, um, amino salicylates, corticosteroids, and immunosuppressant drugs like methotrexate. All of these drugs also have serious side effects, and most of the time they're only effective for pretty short periods of time. At some point in time, particularly when young people develop um, Crohn's or colitis, um, the drugs just don't work anymore, and the next thing is surgery to remove damaged parts of the colon, or in some cases, the entire colon. Um, sometimes it's recommended, and many times it's medically necessary to do it because of the damage. As with all chronic and degenerative conditions, diet plays a major role in the development and progression of inflammatory bowel disease. And I think due to the limited efficacy of the drugs and surgeries and treatments, I think all patients should really look closely at trying to use diet and all other means possible to help themselves so that the use of drugs is at a minimum and the use of surgeries is at a minimum. I don't think that we can say in all cases everybody's going to go into remission as a result of diet or, or um, diet and lifestyle changes, but I think based on the miserable track record of the drugs, boy, it sure is worth a try. And most people get better when they improve their diet, no matter what condition they have when you think about it. 
The next topic I have for today is a bit disturbing and also real hopeful. I guess it depends, it depends on how you look at things. Um, we'll start with something disturbing. A disturbing health statistic is the increase in the incidence of childhood cancers. For example, childhood cases of acute lymphoblastic, um, lymphoblastic anemia, ALL, are increasing by about 1% a year. And those increases are principally seen in westernized countries. ALL currently develops in one out of every 2,000 children. According to new research, most cases of childhood ALL can be prevented. That's the hopeful part. The most comprehensive analysis of data on ALL ever performed, it was just published recently, shows that the disease begins with a genetic mutation that develops before birth that predisposes a child to develop leukemia. But only 1% of children who have this mutation actually develop ALL or any form of leukemia. The second step in the process is the most important, and this is when the disease is triggered by one or more infections. The difference between the child who does and does not develop ALL is the lack of infections during the first year of life, or what researcher Mel Greaves refers to as the delayed infection theory. This means that children who do not have infections and illnesses during the first year of life have immune systems that are not quote unquote properly primed. Later, when the child is exposed to some type of common bacterial or viral infection, the onset of ALL is triggered. In one cluster of leukemia cases that Greaves looked into in Milan, Italy, for example, all of the children had recently been infected with the flu virus and had spent the first year of their life not being sick. Greaves' findings were published in May of this year, 2018. They represent, what he published in this article represents the, find, uh, the findings of 30 years of research on all kinds of causes and the biology of childhood leukemia. One thing he's crystal clear on, and he said this actually in a couple of interviews, he says research shows that ALL is not caused by radiation or pollution, electric wires, electromagnetic fields or waves or chemicals. And he, you can kind of hear his frustration uh, in the interviews that um, he believes that the focus on these things really distracts from finding real causes of diseases like ALL. He also says in his interviews that the research that he's done only applies to ALL and other forms of leukemia, including childhood leukemia, uh, have other causes. He also says that his findings are pertinent, however, not just to ALL, but he believes that there's some relevance to other conditions that involve the immune system, like allergies and autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes. Reeves says that preventing ALL may, might be just as simple as exposing infants to several common and harmless bugs during their first year of life in order to prime the immune system, and then you might serve a dual role of also preventing allergies and autoimmune diseases as well. He says that, um, um, he says that uh, the opportunity to prevent ALL is very important, and I agree with him on this, and one of the reasons is that the cure rate is really high, and, and there's not much hopefulness in cancer. I mean, really, there, has not been, there have not been as many advancements as I think we would all like to see in cancer treatment, but this really has been a bright light because 90% of all childhood cases are cured with chemotherapy. But I think we have to keep in mind that 10% of children die, and also many of, of the survivors are plagued with long-lasting side effects, which include long-lasting psychological distress, uh, learning disabilities, fatigue, growth delays, thyroid dysfunction, hearing loss, and the development of secondary cancers. So this is indeed exciting news. I mean, it's certainly actionable, something we can do something about. And I think that more understanding about the real causes of cancer and not thinking that being next to utility poles is the cause, I think that's all a step in the right direction. But I have a lot of concerns as to how this is gonna be used and I'll share them with you. The first thing is, that deliberate exposure to bugs in infancy is so contrary to our current public health policies, which include right now trying to prevent any and all illnesses in all children as much as possible. I mean, that's one of the goals of the current vaccination schedule. We don't want children to get sick. Public health authorities would have to make a great big shift in their thinking in order for this information to be put to good use. And I think history has taught us that great big shifts in thinking don't happen in medicine very often. Another concern is that this might lead to more genetic testing in order to identify at-risk children. Genetic testing has proven to be useless and often harmful for almost all people for all reasons. Um, there are several articles in the Health Briefs Library. I'm not going to regurgitate all of that here, but just state it for the record. 
Another concern I have is how the information might be used to promote even more vaccinations. So just take this for example, genetic testing identifies a child who has the mutation. The response is to make sure that the child has a flu vaccine every year um, in order to keep him from getting sick. And even though the vaccine has been proven to be useless for all ages and carries a very significant risk of harm. So the bottom line is scientific discovery is a pretty amazing thing when it's used appropriately and honestly, not so much when it's used by public health officials and their drug company and device maker partners. Um, often the results aren't so good. So I really think that the people who will make the best use of this information are parents. Um, first of all, I think it's important to reassure parents that um, preventing all childhood illness is a misguided strategy and that training the immune system to respond appropriately to bugs and viruses is a normal part of development. Uh, while chronic illness is a sign that something is wrong, we need to look at no illness as a sign that something is wrong too. The child's immune system is not being developed properly. Kids get sick and they get well, often with no intervention at all. This is really necessary for normal development. So all in all, wonderful discovery amazing information. We'll see what happens, but to the parents that I'm talking out there, and there are tens of thousands of you that I'm talking to uh, through this weekly broadcast, you have good information about how you can reduce the risk of one form of leukemia in your children. All right, that's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.